Hello, everybody. This week on the Four Seasons of Film podcast, we are interviewing actor Paul Rossi. And come along with us on this ride as we talk about the industry, acting itself, and who else knows what else. So we're calling this the actor's episode, and it took 418 episodes to get you on the air. I don't think you've ever been on before, right? <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. I mean, no, that's that really is amazing. We've done all these episodes, and our kind of best friend actor has never been on to talk <laughs> about acting. I mean, that's yeah. that's insane. Because, you know, I always consider, even though we haven't worked together in so many years, you're one of those rare actors where we can just be you know, horrible people in front of, and you don't judge us. And that's, a, that's, yeah, a, that's yeah. a good compliment. I think. <laughs> no, it's the same goes. It's a back and forth. It's a give and take situation on that one. Yeah. I mean, there, there's very few people that you can just be vulnerable enough to kind of like metaphorically and actually show your ass to without judgment in this industry, <laughs> especially. <laughs> that's the baseline. I think that's a great baseline. I forgot about that. I just forgot all about that. The moment you said it, I saw my ass karate kicking. I, I don't I'm, I don't know the memory you're talking about, but we'll get to it. Uh, <laughs> I was I was literally just pulling something out of my ass, but now yeah, you pulled one. Oh my god! It was, it was uh, Sean's film. Sean Sean Fleming's film. I went to film school with yeah. him. Yeah, the reason it kicked in the memory was because it was in our old apartment, and I bare ass that I was fully naked in that scene but just never. wow see this <laughs> this is the scary part about this episode because it's going to bring up memories i yeah. i've not thought about for years which i'm so yeah. excited to do i don't think i've thought about that since it happened oh <laughs> I'm blind that one out. that's amazing but yeah i mean that really what you said it really does boil down to that vulnerability with people if you don't have that trust I don't think you're really going to get a decent product out of anything. Well, you met, you know, you met us and especially me at a really vulnerable age too. I just moved, you know, 3000 miles from home. I'd never been away from home. I was 18 in Los Angeles, brand new city, you know, scared shitless. And, you know, I, I basically get off the bus or out of the cab and I see your fiendish ass looking at me <laughs> and, you know, outside of our, our apartment, we were going to share together. And it was kind of just like, Oh, good. Game on. This feels this feels right already. And, you know, there was a lot of paranoia that was lifted as soon as I saw you because it I don't know. You, you give that vibe off to a lot of people, which I have talked to about you. You have <laughs> so, you were such a people person and you're so much fun to be around. I mean, it was just like the best it was the best experience for me was having you as a roommate because it was fun and again, vulnerable, and we were both passionate about what we wanted to do and accomplish in film school. Yeah, it's uh, what they call a bromance at first sight, I guess. I think we invented it. <laughs> <laughs> it for sure happened. You know that moment where everything just slows down, slow motion, and you're getting out of the car and your hair's flowing. <laughs> I don't think I had hair back then. <laughs> Nothing like that, no. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was that moment of just relief, like, oh, good, this guy doesn't look like an absolute asshole or a douchebag. Right. And then just immediately having almost a rapport immediately is very odd. But yeah. Yeah. Like that, that thing about myself, it's really weird that I don't give it off visually, but for whatever reason, then people, whatever, I don't know. It's weird. It's a weird thing to have. I remember one of my teachers at one point stopping us in the middle of class, acting class, and asking me if I had any idea. Uh, the power, as he said, I had over women. And I was just, what? Wow. No, and it was a really weird comment. And as he said it, I wasn't aware of myself at that age of anything. And as he said it, I sat there and I realized the girl was braiding my hair. <laughs> <laughs> and another one, I had my legs up on her legs, like relaxed in the middle of class. I was like, what the? Fuck, power you say yeah. power you say <laughs> yeah, and I, yeah it's what, if i had a mustache i would have just absolutely twiddled wait a second didn't you have a mustache back then yeah but it was just like a you want to call that a mustache pubic but, hair let's let's be honest you know when you go to puberty it started at I think age 17 was when i started puberty i think i'm just catching up so it's okay <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah, so funny so whatever whatever mustache i had then wasn't twiddleable 
but whatever you yeah, said, I'm, you have a power over women. Andy immediately perked up <laughs> and he rubbed his bald head. And <laughs> that's right. This, the women braid your hair. Okay, I'm out on one front. Is there any other tips you can give Andy? No, <laughs> but they can rub my skin. They can rub my that bald is, head. Yeah, oh God, please. Um, but no, I don't. I don't mean that to sound arrogant by any measure. And that's not something I thought of myself at that time. It was just something that that teacher who was very perceptive on uh, humans on a level that I've never encountered in my life. Which teacher Very, was this? What, do you remember his name? Uh, Doug, oh yeah, Doug Matranga. Doug, that's right. Doug, was he he's the Meisner teacher? Yes. That's right. Oh my God. Yeah. I remember sitting in on one of those classes with him and going, I don't, I wasn't emotionally mature enough to do Meisner back then, I don't think. No, I don't think anybody <laughs> yeah. is at that point in their life. It's such, it's just such a mind fuck. Well, for, for the uninitiated, meaning Andy, yeah, uh, will, you tell, will you tell Andy what, what the Meisner technique is? Oh, my God. Dude. Wait, wait. I, I can tell you wait, what it is. Wait, let's, let's let Andy. He says he knows what it is. Let, let's let Andy tell you, and then you can correct him. It was a technique pioneered by Michael Meisner. Correct. He's good. And t- 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 tapping into the emotion of a past event to becoming, bringing it to the present, to the character that you're playing. I mean... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now, <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> to interject, <laughs> just just because I asked him this, Paul, I I wanted to ask you this before we get into the <laughs> acting, th- what you think is, as an actor, your philosophy of being acting. Is it intimidating to know that Andrew Pesha has more credits on IMDb than most of my working acting <laughs> friends? <laughs> One, it's not surprising. <laughs> and with a pedigree, that is, <laughs> um, Andrew Pesha, it's not, it, just, it really isn't surprising at all. Well, I always say that you, if, you li- what you, if you're an actor, hook up with a filmmaker, room with, with a filmmaker, be best friends with a filmmaker, because a lot of it is just, oh God, I need to go cast somebody. Hey, Andy, you're here. Boom. Get in the film. And I'm cheap labor. Um, I think someone perfected that. Oh, Kevin Smith. Kevin Smith. I mean, yeah, I, that, and he I was mean, a large reason I went to film school because he made it look really easy. You know, I thought I fancied myself, uh, you know, a funny guy, a funny writer. I wanted to attempt filmmaking and that definitely was that it's like, all right, well, you know, I'm too nervous to ask to real actors to be in my stuff because I don't know how to deal with actors. So you use your friends and then funnily enough, you know, 30 years later, your friend has 200 credits from all of the stuff you put him in. And the joke is he's not gotten any better at his craft. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you start at the top, I guess. <laughs> Andy, why don't you ever throw down the gauntlet and say, hey, fuck you. No, I am. I know what I'm doing in front of the camera. Well, because oh, it's, it's, a, <laughs> it's, a, it's a learning experience, man. You, I don't think you ever truly learn unless you're like Daniel Day Lewis, but you know, I'm sure it's like, it's a journey. Man. Unless you, that's the bar is you're nobody or Daniel Day Lewis. I want to get there. <laughs> Damn, Andy, that I, I, I feel bad to be your friend. Like what kind of pedestal do you put me on or not put me on? Uh, directors, yeah. I don't know as much. So you're good. <laughs> directors, I don't know as much. I know Daniel Day Lewis and uh, that's it. Yeah. Does Daniel Day Lewis have a director though? That tie in, you know, how Leonardo is now Scorsese's little boy toy for right. Every- every part does nobody has day lewis like that do they no and he retired too so i think he went out you know seemingly on top because he wasn't tied down to anything he never did a bad film i even watched i started watching his early stuff and even that i mean he was a small part in bounty with uh, anthony hopkins and <laughs> mel gibson in the 80s and then he did this this weird independent film um the laundromat i think it's called in the 80s and even that is just like an 18 year old punk kid he was amazing right out of the gate. That's the thing. Like that old, old phrase, like they've got it, man. Like some people do. Like he is one of those people that I think he just came out of the womb, just ready to go for acting. Yeah. People I think are born in this life as much as he wants to be what a cobbler. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <right? laughs> this week, I think, you know, <laughs> I think he wants is to be that, a cobbler. This cobbler. I which think- is a whole thing. I think I'd walk around yeah. as Lincoln for the rest of my life if I played it as well as he did in Lincoln. And it would, it would just be fun 
because I'd keep the voice and, and, <laughs> and dress like Lincoln just to fuck with everybody for the rest of my days. Halloween would be easy. Just draw a little. Because <laughs> everybody would go like, you're not. Are you? No <laughs> way. Lincoln jokes. <laughs> <laughs> back to acting, Andy. No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, but okay. So let's back up. So you, and, so you and I meet in film school. You're in the acting program. I'm in the directing program. Mm -hmm. I want to go into, you know, why, why acting in the first place, why you chose it, um, you know, a little brief history. I'm more interested in when you get to film school and then living in LA and all that, but just a brief history of acting and, and why and how you got into it up to film school. Up to, so a lot of people that I noticed encountering out there were, um, previous like after school they would do all the school plays and the musicals and i i did none of that um my background was just an absolute obsession and love of cinema and acting is the one it's kind of I, I didn't have a voice when i was that age so being a director seemed obscene to me still does to me yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> The hard, yeah, well, we can't even get into that. That's just a, um, but I, I just loved the idea of it and the acting seemed like the more uh, approachable route for me mm -hmm. for whatever. And that's just what I, what I really connected to in a lot of films, um, uh, was just the acting portion of it. So I was, I'd wanted to do it since I was little and it was like a secret. I never told anybody until I think I was in my twenties. And then one day I was just like, I'm moving to Los Angeles and going to go start acting. Wow. <laughs> See that, that to me is the, is the amazing part of everybody's journey. You know, that's in this industry. There is this constant leap of faith that everybody takes at a certain point, whether you're in your twenties, you know, your teenage years or, you know, people in their fifties, I've, I've heard, you know, giving it all up and becoming a screenwriter or moving to Los Angeles and being an actor then. So you, I, I always think the same thing. I don't know how I did it at 18 because I couldn't do it now if it was something that wasn't film industry, if it was something that was just a huge gamble industry yeah. and I just went, I'm just going to go and move to London and become a bricklayer, you know, or something like that. There's no way I would have, I would have the fortitude to just say blindly, I'm giving all this up to go take a huge chance and put myself in, into the lottery of Hollywood, most of <laughs> which spits you out and chews you up strike that reverse it but you know what i mean <laughs> yeah it's the it does a number on people that is 100 percent sure i mean you see it every day it's just a it's a recycling machine but yeah not the good kind so what was the leap you know what 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 did you just blindly you know just no, think I, you could do it i just I, I wanted to do it it wasn't a matter of, like a lot of people too came out with the idea like i want to be famous yeah that was objective and my whole objective was to learn the craft. That is a, all I wanted to do. And anything that came from that would be wonderful in my mind, was my only thought. I just wanted the craft. And I, re I remember that about you. You were one of those you, n seemingly normal <laughs> people that were going yeah. there to learn and study instead of, there were so many people we did go to film school with that were so into just being there, the mystique of being in Hollywood, like they... They had, they'd won something already or they're just, you know, they were really important and they're just studying, you know, this because they're, they're about to get their big break no matter what. There were very few people, to me at least, that were interested in, from the director's, you know, point of view, making films, making good films, studying films, studying film history. And from the, you know, in the actors group that you had, I don't know if you're your situation was the same, but, you know, from the few friends and acquaintances that we both knew together, you know, maybe one or two from that group that I could say really wanted to become a, just the best actor they could be. Yeah. Abe, he left, but Abe was one of those guys. That's what I was going to say too. Abe was the, uh, Abe, Abe was number one, I think. Good. He was so good. And he looked amazing on camera. He's a very weird looking human being in real life, but man, on camera, Good amazing news. amazing his name was abe ruthless is probably a stage name and he had a band called the fuck you ups <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> he took me to papa's for the first time uh, <laughs> i had no idea what it was 
And you know what? And to that note, actually, about that whole world of people that are out there for just bullshit reasons. Yeah. Um, I had no idea what a trust fund was until I stepped foot in that class. Oh, oh man, I, that's that's such a huge, huge that that man. I could not relate to that sentence any more than than oh my god that just hit me uh, like a nostalgic brick i had never even heard the word trust fund really unless it was on a tv show or movie and i just so it disregarded it because it didn't exist in my world and it still doesn't exist in my world and probably won't for you know ever well you know, the funny thing is <laughs> the funny thing is about that is we the first few weeks of film school or i can't even remember how long you and I didn't have any transportation, so we would just yeah. bum rides with this girl I, that lived in the building, and she drove a BMW. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I totaled my car the first day I moved to LA. <laughs> That's right. Oh, my God. <laughs> Tell us that story. It was horrible, man. So, where I'm from in Indiana. Uh, <laughs> Bremen, Indiana. Bremen, Indiana. Look it up. Good luck. <laughs> 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 I didn't... I was... I had drove from there to Los Angeles um, in two days. It was actually a feat. I drove 18 hours the first day, then 16 the second. By my, so by the time I got there, I, I shouldn't have been driving realistically because my brain was not operating. And what I didn't know is that they have stop signs or stop lights rather for the on and off ramps in parts of Los Angeles. Right, meter lights, yeah. Yeah, so I did not know, and I was looking down at the map trying to find our apartment, and then I look up, and I see the back end of another car, and that was that. <laughs> oh, first, like, wh where are we talking in Los Angeles? Like, the 101, you know, are you in Hollywood? Where are you? 101, right off the 101, right off of Burbank. I was right by our exit. No, you were off on the Barham Boulevard exit? You could throw a rock. Oh, my God ended up staying the first because I showed up early because I assumed the apartment would be ready, which it was not <laughs> you know, for when they told us it was ready. So I stayed at the Glen Capri Hotel or mo Motel, let's get it right, <laughs> which was featured in the, the musical Dancing Bears. I don't know, that stupid movie with the bears and they're in a band and they play music. I don't know, it's a oh, yeah. Country movie. Bears. Yeah, there you go. That's Country one. Bears. I remember they had all the fires up in front. Oh my God. I had pictures of it. And I was like, this is my first week in Los Angeles. <laughs> I wrecked my car and I'm staying at the shittiest motel in Burbank. Yeah. No sign of when my apartment will be ready. It was a horrible experience. I, I actually wanted. think that probably prepared you for life as an actor after film school. <laughs> like that's, that's how it kind of feels when you get done with film school. Mm -hmm. Pretty much good luck. Bye. Yeah, here's uh thanks for the money and here's no context and uh, yeah. yeah, you get, here's here's basically nothing for you and you're going to get smacked in the ass for a long time. Yeah, it's like high school but a million times worse cuz high school you just go back to your parents' house like Los Angeles just like this little part of your home that was what like 8 months we did that. Yeah, and then you get out and it you you join a city that you thought didn't want you, but you're like, no, no, I'm going to put my head down. I'm going to get graduate this, uh, this film school, and then they'll want me. And you realize after you get out of film school, boy, they really don't want you then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. It's almost, it's really insulting. It is not for the pain of heart. No, no. Any part, any part of that industry is just, it, it'll eat you up if it let you, and it'll eat you up regardless. So when you're in acting school, acting class, whatever you want to say. Um, you know, what is what your, what is your impressions from going into film school, wanting to be an actor versus the reality of going and doing it? Was there a staunch difference? You know what, you know, tell us about, tell us about what that was like. Well, it's kind of, you have an idea of what it's going to be like. And for me, when you have like my prerequisite was I think I was in one play and I didn't have any lines. So, you know, real hard to do that one. <laughs> wow. That's all, the, that's all the experience you had. Yeah. And I was in a mass media class where we made videos, but it wasn't like anything near a range of, it was no acting. It was just kind of kids making films, no script. No, it was just stupid guerrilla style stuff that made no sense. Yeah. I, I mean, I had zero experience and you could see you, if you, <laughs> You could tell. 
And I'm sure a lot of the, I remember those directors in your class talking shit about me and being like, that guy couldn't act his way out of a bag. No shit. Who was this? I don't remember this. Yeah, plenty of them. I'd heard it. And it's just weird shit you hear from, you know, because there, everybody wants to bag on somebody for something. And to be honest, at that time, I was so green that I was learning. So I didn't take it as anything. It pissed me off and it made me, you know, want to do better. Right. But it wasn't going to wreck my life that a bunch of student film directors think I'm shit when all that they have seen was no dialogue acting. <laughs> <laughs> when I had heard it, there was no, there was no dialogue yet. We hadn't reached that state for your guys um, filmmaking. Right. Cause we were, we started out doing silent, silent I films know. for, I think the first six weeks or something, eight weeks. So it was just weird to be like, which I kind of loved because I could almost do it like vaudevillian style, which I was always in love with, like Charlie Chaplin, the Buster Keaton. Oh yeah. I mean, look, even look at my, you know, my thesis film, we had silent film was featured in yeah. it. So we were cut from the same cloth there. We, you know, silent film and film without dialogue it's harder to act in those than it is with dialogue, you know, and, th and that was the biggest thing when the sound, the sound change came in in the 30s. The, the silent film actors, they were going, this isn't acting. Acting is with your yeah. eyes and with your emotions and with your face. And what the fuck Audience. is this? It's cheating to, to have dialogue. Well, it, yeah, I think what dialogue was basically the same thing that happened um, when Brando switched from play plays over to film mm -hmm. was you took a style that was working and everybody loved it, but you gave them a different option. And once you had that option, everything else was obsolete. Once Brando came, every actor was obsolete. You're, you're absolutely right. In the 30s, in the 40s, dialogue was new and then they perfected it to yeah. the studio system, which became a factory system. Say the dialogue on the page. You know, there were yeah. great actors that existed back then, but Brando came along and he looked at the, the page and he went, well, I don't have to do this. I can do whatever the hell I want inside the frame. I could say it. I could not say it. I could pick up the glove. I could smack Rosemary in the face. I mean, that, that he literally changed acting forever. And I hope he, I think he knew it, but I hope he really knew it. Uh, he was such an egotistical maniac that 100% he knew it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> was when you get that big, it's like Orson Welles. I think that the ego allows yeah. you to let, just physically let yourself get that unhealthy. Yeah, but you, well, I like you need that ego though to kind of have that drive because a lot. If you don't have that confidence and the ego to back up that revolutionary change, like if he would have just came out meek and been like, "Oh, I'm Brando," and just played like he was playing a whatever. And if he would have done his approach to acting that he had done on stage and brought that to film, it wouldn't have worked. He knew to make the adjustments that he needed to make, you know? Well, yeah, so, shit, man. I mean, ego, yeah, you have to have a certain amount of ego to do any job in this business. I mean, it, it, I've learned that along the way from since you met me as a, you know, a pimple popping teenager to, you know, just getting done with this TV show I just shot and going, my God, you know, you have, you have to hold up a certain amount of ego just so people don't walk all over you, eat you alive and then make their film versus the one you want to make. Exactly. It's like ego mixed with a confidence. Like it's, if you let the ego take over, then it's going to be a problem. But if you don't walk with confidence or say or do anything you do, then it's not going to change. Like if Brando would come over and just been meek about it, then nothing would have happened. So he would have had to have that confidence and that kind of ego and drive. Because you imagine being that director the first time and somebody, what the hell is this? Like, <laughs> I'm surprised they didn't fire his ass. I'm sure he did get fired initially. Yeah. Or, or it was just that good. Even then the director yeah. went, I don't know. I have something really special here. Yeah, exactly. It, it, that's I'd imagine what happens. <laughs> He's the legend that he is. Yeah. Well, speaking of ego, that, that I mean, it goes back to film school. You you know, thinking about that time that we were there, and you know what you just told us about the directors in my class, and then thinking about the ego of the entire building and the all the classes combined. You know, it it's so hard to separate the ego from the work in those in that time we were there, but. There were there there was some good work coming out of, of the New York Film Academy. There were good people coming out of it. I'm just curious to see, you know, what you took away 
that was that was positive from that experience. You know, there there because I can remember a handful of people that were there for the right reasons. And those are the people that I wish that I would have aligned with more and cared less about the ego of the other people there just because you wanted to feel cool or included right. or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm trying to, we want to reiterate that. That we kind of like the. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> I got so involved in listening to what you were saying. I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, no, the, some good takeaways from from your oh, from your acting experience in that school. No, no, no. It was funny because you were saying it, and I thought of it right away, and I was like, oh, I got a perfect start for this, and then I just got enthralled. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it was for me. It was building blocks. That's all I wanted like little wood building blocks. And that's what I brought away from that place because I knew nowhere in my brain, anyone's right brain in Lester, an egomaniac <laughs> would have walked out of that school being like, I'm going to go direct a film at fucking Warner brothers right now. Oh my God. That's so funny. The first day, um, the first day of my class, they sat us down. We had Larry Lee. He, he was the professor of directing and mm -hmm. he asked, the really he asked the class, the very first question, he said, look out that window. There's the Black Tower over at Universal. He goes, raise your hand if you think you could walk into that Black Tower and get a film green lit. How many people rose their hands? All Two. Of them? Two. That's arrogant enough. I thought so too. And it was, it was people that I, I couldn't, you know, it wasn't the people that you would think. It was people that were, you're going like, wow, that guy's confident. Oh, wow, she's really confident. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't who you think like the, the egomaniacs even even had kind of the the tenacity to stay quiet and until you know they could make their voice heard in other ways at some point you're gonna be like oh this is a trap and yeah if you're dumb walk right in the trap, then you're the asshole with your hand up and everybody else is looking at you like those are the guys <laughs> 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 yeah, totally it's like when the, the the writing professor asks what your favorite film is and you say gone with the wind and uh. he, and he calls you a pussy which happened to me <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. answer, though, so. I don't know what I I don't know why I said it I don't it's just one of those things you're put on the spot there's 35 people looking at you and this guy goes it's the first day of class what's your favorite oh. film and I'm like either uh, gone with the wind and you could feel the air drop out of this room and just like the people that raised their hands they went what the fuck's wrong with this kid <laughs> <laughs> What an asshole for loving a classic. I know, really. But now I look back and I go like, oh my God. I mean, Gone with the Wind, it's, a, it's classic 1939. You know, it's, it's one of the most classic films of all time. But really, kid, that's your answer? I mean, I loved my writing teacher so much. So I, I don't blame him for saying that to me. But wow. I guarantee you, though, that you fell in love with that teacher that moment, didn't you? I did. And, and I took, he literally was my favorite teacher of the entire yeah. run because he wasn't saying it to be a dick. He was saying it to bring some kind of levity to the room, you know, to make a joke, you know, not embarrass me. Just go like, that was ridiculous. You know that, but he said it with that word. <laughs> Such a perfect word. <laughs> I know. So, I mean, it, did, it didn't scar me either. I mean, I can tell you, and I'm laughing generally, like, because it's so, it makes me happy so much to tell that story to people because they... It, oh, it's terrifying when it happened. Like, 100%, like, Pants shitting, pissing, terrifying. Well, you had but, this idea in school, or at least I did, that every moment you're interacting with someone in the business, whether it's a guest lecturer or whether you're out to dinner and you see the dean or you go to the universal lot and you think you saw Brett, Brett Ratner. I mean, you, you have this idea when you're out there and young and green, every moment matters because it could, it could yeah. mean your golden ticket or it could mean here's your bus ticket. Yeah, and it's like, Realistically, it's kind of not like that. You're just living your life, but it feels that way the moment you step out of that school and you're just thrown. I remember them going through like <laughs> the last week, like, here's what you'll want to do is like send out your headshot and resume. And then I followed all of the directions. And I, like I said, I took all their little building blocks that they gave me. But like I said, I'm not going to ever in my mind think that I was going to be sitting in a restaurant and be found, you know. Right, but we all had that delusion, I think. Oh, God, I wish. It would have been perfect. It would have been amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's why everybody dresses up to go everywhere in L.A., and especially yeah. especially now, oh, my God, everybody looks, they look like they're like walking out of social media in Los Angeles because they think that it's just going to happen that way, and it's like, kids, it 
it might not even happen if you are the best at what you do in Hollywood. The worst part, because literally for me, all I wanted to do was just act. Yeah. And so that's the part that a lot of people and actors can't handle is that auditioning process and being rejected. And it's, I enjoyed it like thoroughly, but it's, ugh. yeah, it's not going to happen like that. And when you think it is, you get real aware of what that is, just the meat factory. I remember when I walked into one of my first big auditions and I just looked around and all I saw were carbon copies of myself. Oh my God, that's terrifying. 30 of me in a room. And just to have that like ego to be sitting somewhere at a restaurant and like, I'm just sitting here having a meal and somebody's going to walk up and be like, buddy, I watched you eat that BLT. <laughs> You're it. <laughs> oh my so, God. What? It's, you know, it's not going to happen. It's, it can happen, but it's not. Okay. What was the audition for that everyone looked the same? Oh my God. I don't flip and rip. It was some stupid ass commercial. Okay. It's just a commercial. That, yeah. Cause that's when you really know, but it was a big commercial. I think it was like a nationwide, but it was one of the first ones I was sent out to by my agent and manager and not picked up by myself. So to me, it was a huge deal. Right, right, because it's like you're, you've arrived because you got a real audition. Yeah, and then once I walked in there, I'm like, oh, God. It was just so disheartening, but then I actually heard a phrase at some point later on, and it was, I think, Garrett Hedlund. What? Yeah. Really? Yeah, younger actor, and uh, it was about him saying that he, uh, I think he read books to set himself apart from everybody else in the room. And not that it actually would, but it gave him, I think, that confidence. Is what from the way I interpreted his comment was it would give you that what felt like a one up over the other people. And when you walk into a room like that, anything you can do to get that one up feeling is going to help your performance. And like, because it's just really disheartening when you see like 30, 40 of you and you're like, oh man, they want to make sure that I can open my mouth and speak correctly. And that's all this is. Right. Well, you know, as being on the other side of that, on the on the casting side of the table for all these years, I think there's there's so many different thoughts I have on the auditioning process. Number one, I, I think it's a terrible, awful process, and somebody should rethink it and redo it completely. Um, I personally, I I, I love it. It's it weeds out the garbage that you're going to already encounter. Like if you can't mentally make it through an audition process and a callback process and you can't replicate in those areas, then what are you going to do when you're on set? Well, that's you know? true. I, I never thought about that aspect. I was speaking of more, you the know, cattle, the cattle running. call of it, the, yeah. the broken hearted dreams aspect of it, you know, and, and sadly most of the time, when I see it, it's early in the day and I, and I know who I want to cast. And by the end of the day, maybe because I'm so tired, I'm not paying attention anymore. And that's just me being honest. It sounds like I'm a huge, huge asshole, but that's, no, that's the nature of the process. It's a job. At the end of the day, that casting is a job. And it's not like, oh my God, if you have to sit, you have to sift through so much garbage. Like, cause there's a lot of these actors and at period are just garbage. Like, <laughs> Sorry, but like you said, like, what's the point of having like a decent actor when you can have a great actor? But it's the matter of either finding that or finding a decent and honing to what you need. And a lot of problems that I found with actors is they're not willing to flex. They right. just want to do it their way. I don't think my character would do that. I don't think that. And that's not the point of acting. And that's not going to get you anywhere. And the whole idea, one of my teachers told me he was the, I was the easiest human being he's ever encountered to direct. <laughs> because I just let them, that's their job. And your job as an actor is to be directed. And at some point, you got to make decisions and calls and you're going to have head butts here and there. But if you don't make those decisions and if they don't make those decisions and it just gets so convoluted and twisted and messed up. Yeah, it's so interesting you say that too because... The, in the audition process, what we've learned 
through independent film, I think it's different than when you get to the studio system. Oh. But, but for our journey, yeah, yeah. it's 100%. it's talent, yes, but it's yeah. also who's going to realize that this is made for not a lot of money. We're not going to be able to coddle you. You're going to have yeah. to be ready. We're going to sometimes have to, you know. We have no permits sometimes. We, we, don't, we don't have trailers, certainly. So who do I want to be in the trenches of warfare with? And, and, you know, honestly, at the indie level, that supersedes talent for us every time. Oh, yeah. It's, at the end of the day, it's kind of like, who do you want to hang out with? Like, who do you want to make? Who do you want to give this opportunity to? And yeah. I think that's the lost thing right now in filmmaking especially with these Marvel films and stuff like they're just giving opportunities away left and right that people don't deserve. And they don't, if you get that, then earn it. If you didn't earn it already is my opinion, like put in the work, put in the effort. Like I don't think people want to do that these days. And that's resulting in just a lot, not a lot of good performances. <laughs> yeah. And then over to over abundance of uh, shitty movies and yeah. it's, it's the same on the director side and the writer side and everything. There's there's so much to be said about the lack of talent out there versus the ab overabundance of product. I mean, you could yeah. watch, you throw a stone and you know you watch, you know, four or five Netflix movies that come out and they all look exactly the, exactly the same. They're all CGI background. You can tell nobody's putting in the work on these things. And then yeah. you watch something that's still like a Martin Scorsese's putting out or a Tarantino's putting out. And these are people that are great at their craft because they wanted to be. And that's all the difference. You know, people, it, it's the biggest thing in Hollywood that always has been, you know, post probably the, after the 70s exploded and, and you know, the, the, the revolution ended basically. They, they just hired people to do the job again instead of people that really loved this industry and wanted to make great art. Yeah, and it just became a burn and churn and money-making process. And I think what we have right now is um, films being made, but we don't have filmmaking. Right. There's a very, very large difference in those set of words. And if you don't know that difference, don't make films get out of the industry for the sake of everybody watching for the sake of me. God damn it. Yeah. <laughs> get out of, get out because yeah. I <laughs> want to keep making films because yeah. Jesus Christ, I've studied my entire <laughs> life to make films. Yeah. And I, 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 I see these people making films and you know, it, you know, I, I wanted to ask you about that too. As an actor, you see all these actors that suddenly just are directing their first film <laughs> and not to name names, but it drives me crazy as a director. Cause I'm not an actor. And I see them and I watch the films and they're just, they're, they're exactly what you think they would be. There's, there are, my first films look like total <laughs> shit because I'm learning and their first films they're directing look like total shit and they're on fucking Netflix or they're in theaters. It's because they have the money. That's all it is. And they're right. in, they're already in, you know, I mean, they can, they can get it off the ground because they're, they're somebody. Now you have the money, you have the power, you have the flex to put yourself in these situations and these acting parts that honestly you shouldn't be in. <laughs> and it gives you license to be lazier. That's the thing. Yeah, you, you can 100%. be you can be lazy. You can you can make mistakes. You can do an eight hour day instead of a fourteen hour day because you have the clout. And you know, to people like us that are still grinding it out and are you know our our last production. We had we finally got a decent amount of money to make this last TV show, and we you know we filmed this pilot independently. We still did. We had a five day shooting schedule to shoot. What was it, Andy? Twenty eight pages. Yeah, twenty eight pages. Two different scenes. Thirty two scenes. We had five days, and we did fourteen hours a day for five days, killing mm. ourselves. But you know, in that way where you get done with it and you go home for the night, and well, I got to be back on set at six or eight. I cannot wait to get back on set because even though I'm this tired, this is amazing. Yeah, because I love what I'm doing you know, at this moment. Like that will, for me, that will always be a driving factor. <laughs> if you're doing, and it's so corny to do what you love and it, until you actually start doing what you love. And for me, it took a long time to find those things that I love to do. But 
without it, you can you can't do days like that. You can't do 15, 16 hour days. Like it's it it's too much of a toll to take if you're not enjoying what you're doing. Well, I can always tell on set the people that number one they want to know, you know, their call time first before everybody, and they want they're the first people that sprint offset when you know their last scene is done. God, see, that's not me. Like to me, I would likely if you guys, if I were a part of that, it would I would stay and help in any fashion, especially in a smaller form of independent film like that. Because to me, that becomes a team effort in my mind, and it should be that way. So if you are an actor on one of those, then you should, you know, we need help with this. We need help with that. Like, what else are you doing right now? Yeah, you can't. Like, this is your film, too. Like, you're in it. So why not put that extra effort forth? Well, two things. It's going to get you hired the next time. And (laughs) and, and number two, our advice is to all actors out there, which I've said this a million times, you know who we look at on set? It, it, the, the call time thing and people that sprint when you're, when you're done. But the people at Gosh. the end of the day that are, act, especially actors, that are help loading out the equipment. Yeah. Or cleaning yes. up in some aspect or doing something. Because it's team effort. And on an independent film, it is like that. And for some no-name actors to roll in and then just want to run off, so like, Jesus, man, like, if you're not enjoying this, what, why, like, why do it? What are we doing it for? I mean, we're not making a ton of money here. Some people don't. Some people are still making no money. Thank God we're making money. But you know, it it speaks to the hierarchy of set also, which we had a big a big discussion about this going into our latest production. That it it kind of it works that there is a hierarchy, but you also have to exist, like you're saying, like this is a team effort that nobody mm-hmm. is better than anybody. You need to have quadrants of what, you know, who talks to who and stuff like that because you don't want yeah. people directing actors, but, you know, it, no. and nobody touching the camera and stuff. But that's just common sense shit about the hierarchy. The hierarchy gets into bullshit when ego comes into play. And that, I think that's it, ego is the it's the biggest problem in the entertainment industry. And I think most of that comes from because it's a visual medium. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> like. It really was what it boils down to. Yeah, you're um, gonna you're gonna see this. But, I need I, I'm represented yeah. by what everybody's gonna see, and they're gonna judge this based on what everybody's gonna see. And nobody really knows out there besides the industry who did what on this thing. They're just looking at the thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because not an average person is not waiting after the film and oh my god, key grip. Yeah. Oh, yeah. oh yeah. John Frank, man, Jesus Christ! You know, I, saw, you know, I saw your work on John Wick too. <laughs> and on our set, it's like key, gr- Which key sucks grip. Because those, those guys do deserve that credit. I'm they absolutely do. But it's not realistic. Yeah, exactly. And and on our sets, it's it's mostly like key grip. Andrew Pesha, you know, uh, Gaffer's, <laughs> yeah. Gaffer's assistant. Yeah, I, I read your, I read your guys' credits. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, we, we, everybody doubled up on you. Double up on so many credits in indie film. I, I literally have to leave out credits because it just yeah. gets embarrassing. How I much? I was going to ask if you just falsified names. Like, we yeah. should start John, doing that. It, I John mean, Richardson the third. Yeah, it, it literally oh, is. I call myself a multi hyphenate, and it's like, yeah, no shit, because there's no other <laughs> word for it. Because multi hyphenate doesn't. It's not multi. It's like uh, the the unlimited amount of hyphenates I've done in this industry just for my own shit. But it, it it's weird because I'm proud of it because you just do what needs to get done, not for a credit, but when you're giving credits out at the end, you go, oh yeah, I did that too. Oh, I did that and that and that. And then Andrew, had, Andy has thirty credits, and then you know Jules has a thousand credits, and but that's 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 my favorite part about indie film. You do what needs to get done, so the project gets done the right way. Today's episode of the Four Seasons of Film podcast is brought to you by Phil's Coffee. Phil's specializes in handcrafted coffee made one cup at a time. Visit a location today or find them on the web at philscoffee.com. That's Phil's with a Z, coffee.com. Find the beans you're looking for. Exactly. And I mean, like, would you rather be a well-rounded human or just a one-trick pony? Oh, my God. I mean, 
<laughs> that and, and get a lot done being a one trick pony, but I'd rather be somebody that can come in and be like, Oh, we got a situation. And, and then having 30 different options of how to fix that situation, which I believe is what a director does. Well, exactly. So and, <laughs> and again, in indie film, there's always going to be somebody that doesn't show up, somebody that gets sick, something that goes wrong. So, you know, if you can do, if, you, if you can do anything, then it saves you time and money and a lot of stress. So get good at everything. It's more advice for, for filmmakers out there. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of filmmakers listen to our podcast, but yeah, don't pigeonhole yourself to one <laughs> credit or one crew member because no. If you know more, you're going to work more. If you just are a director, they're trying to tell me this in film school, and I told them to go fuck themselves. But it's so <laughs> true that I went, when I showed up to film school, all the way up until my thesis film, nobody mm -hmm. knew that I had experience as a sound guy, only because I had been in bands my whole life. Oh, yeah. So I had a, you know, I had a dat, you know, I, 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 knew all the, I knew all the stuff. And when they yeah. saw that, all my fellow classmates went, well, he's going to be the sound guy on my thesis film. Uh -oh. And I had decided, I had to literally tell all of them, <laughs> I'll be the sound guy on one thesis film, but I did not come to film school to be a sound guy. Yeah, this is directing, not sound guy yeah. studio. I mean, in <laughs> retrospect, I, I mean, knowing what we just paid our sound guy, Andy, on, oh, on track check, <laughs> oh my God, it's literally... Less to deal with, and you can just get a nice, nice. And he, uh, and by the way, Gabe, we love you. Yes, He's out there. He the was best. the best sound guy we ever worked. He's worth every <laughs> dollar. But it's an industry. I should have just been a fucking sound guy. I, I would have, I would have made twenty thousand times more money if I was a niche thing like a sound person. Well, yeah, it's those weird jobs you don't know about that just pay stupid bank. Like the music industry is the same way. Like you just. All of a sudden, you're like, "Oh, there's that guy," and then that dude is like, works a few shows and then goes home to his mansion, and you would never expect it. I'd but, spend more on a sound person than I would on anything else on set. Yeah, exactly. Because do you want your film to sound like this the entire like? You know, People so. will not forgive you shitty sound, which we've learned <laughs> so many times. And I, I look back <laughs> on some of my films and I go, "Oh, that's why that person thought I sucked." <laughs> <laughs> Shit. But yeah. that's the thing too is like how you were saying not to get pigeon held, but also not to let people do that to you. Exactly. Exactly. Really dove into there. Um, but a lot of people will do that and they'll just try to because especially with acting, because what it is when I was doing it, you're just called in for a specific look almost a hundred percent of the time. Yeah. So when you come in with a look and you don't have whatever the look is and the character behind that, it becomes very weird. And that became very hard for me um, to get jobs and like agent and managers would be great. But then after a while, they'd be like, I don't know what to do with you. I and mean, you know how many times I was told I'm not a big enough asshole. Wow. You know how fucking weird that is to hear because I really pride myself on being a, Nice human being. Yeah, I was going to say, like, you're not an asshole at all. Why do you have to be an asshole in, in auditions and in, yeah. as an actor? Well, what's weird, it, you know, when I think about it, and I think about uh -huh. you as an actor that I met and worked with so many times, you know, I always thought you as more of a character actor and not this kind of, like, one <laughs> image fits all kind of guy. You know, I, I, I always liked how you manipulated your look, your hair. We put makeup on you. You played characters, you know. I, I remember seeing you on stage for some kind of uh, project you did for your, your class where you were kind of playing like Buster Keaton, you know, like, and it just, yeah. it just uh, you always just struck me as kind of a, well, I don't want to look like this all the time. I want to be a versatile actor. And I always thought that was the point of, of acting, but there yeah. are some people I remember yeah. specifically there was a, there was a, I don't know if this kid was in your group or not, but oh, I, rem I remember he, I remember they, we were, we were at a party and he's like, no, fuck that guy. No. <laughs> <laughs> we were at a party and he's a big muscly guy. And, and we were outside <laughs> and I, I remember talking to him and I said, you know, so like, what are you going for as an actor? And, and he, and he said, well, I want to be like the next Schwarzenegger yeah. or the next Stallone. Yeah. I called him, um, 
the oh my god the Alabama because he was the Alabama kid, right? Oh my I don't god. know where he was from, but I remember yeah. thinking that was so odd that you came out to Hollywood and wanted to be the next Schwarzenegger. <laughs> and now when I look back and I go, that's kind of genius, though. He knew what he yeah. wanted to do, and he chiseled yeah. himself, and he, he he showed up. He was such a nice guy. I remember. I can't fucking remember his name for the life of me. But, but I had a, I had a nickname for him. Because I think I called him the generic. Uh, Schwarzenegger or something. I mean. The Alabama Slammer. Yeah, like generic Vin Diesel or Alabama Vin or something like See, that. See, that's smart to me is showing up and wanting to be that guy. What, yeah. what didn't make sense to me was when we met another guy, and I've, I've told this story on the podcast a thousand <laughs> times, that literally we're at another party and he looked like and dressed just like Johnny Depp. I mean, he looked oh, exactly God. like him. Remember this oh. guy? Yeah, there was a pandemic around that time era too. Everybody wanted to be Johnny Depp, and I was loved Johnny Depp at that time. Oh my yeah. God! Everybody, every male wanted to be Johnny Depp, and they dressed just like him. And you think you you would think this is so counterintuitive? They already have this. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, it's like, why are you gonna? Well, that's Hollywood, though, isn't it? <laughs> that's true. That's true. I mean, look. The, the only thing I would say is don't dress just like you're on the pay, on, you're coming off of us us weekly magazine as Johnny Depp because they're gonna you, you look like you're wearing a costume. Yeah, exactly. Because Johnny's wearing a costume. Like Jesus. Especially this, at this point. I mean he has to, I think. Otherwise people would be like, wait, you're not Johnny Depp. Yeah. I, uh Daniel Tosh has got a great joke about that. He's like, I'm Johnny Depp and I leave my house and I have to have my handkerchief just so <laughs> <laughs> he's wrist. got like eighty of them now. Thirty bracelets on and you know. I but, think I yeah, think that was so stupid to me that era. I mean, I get it. Johnny was great. At least I don't know if he is anymore. I don't fucking know what he is anymore. We'll see. I mean, he's got some stuff <laughs> yeah. coming out, but I know what you mean. It's I'm always I'm always excited to see him do stuff, but I just want to see him get back to like not old Johnny, but he had this penetrating ability to just connect. And not a lot of people have that ability. And to be able to connect through a TV screen is insanity. And that guy had it in tropes. Well, you just want to watch him. And I miss actors that you just want to watch. You don't want to, you don't necessarily want to hear them. You don't, you just want to observe them on screen. And he was maybe one of the last actors for us that did that. He was just so magnetic up there. You, you didn't know what he was going to do next. No, it was just wild because it's scripted. <laughs> yeah. And he but never, and he never, I, never watching himself too is 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 amazing because he he didn't even get to critique himself. He just went out there and did it purely, and then it's in the can. Oh my god, I've got a great story about taking one of his techniques, and it backfired to an because I would refuse to watch myself after as well because I hated it. That surprises me. I, I felt like we watched we watched a lot of your stuff that we filmed together. Uh, fucking torment for me. <laughs> I'm glad you told I, me now. Yeah, I'm, like I said, I'm a very nice person. I just, like, I'm <laughs> fuck you, Nathan. I, I'll watch this, but fuck you. <laughs> no, I enjoy it. I just don't want to see myself. And I think that's like Johnny's thing was not seeing himself. But I also read a technique that he does. And it's um, whenever he would have a, not a casting, because there's no reason to Johnny to go through the casting Right, process. yeah. <laughs> but when they would have their table reads. Mm-hmm. He would go in blind and he would make no decisions while reading the part. He would just read the part and that was it. So a lot of two actors will come in and make, they'll start making those choices right away at the table. read. I've seen it. Yeah. I've yeah. seen, I've <laughs> seen both sides of the coin where mm -hmm. we had a table read one time and this actor who should not be named showed up for the <laughs> table read. And not only did he show up, well, no, he, he, he had read the script, so it was obviously he knew, he knew his part. But he auditioned 40 different characters during the table read. Get the fuck out of here. And so it threw off the table read so bad, and he wasn't doing it for any other reason besides getting attention. And that drove Just me like, fucking insane. The flexes. Yeah. <laughs> Abilities. I mean, Andy, do you remember this? He did it. He did one time. Yeah. He was doing it as an English accent, and he was from the streets. Then he was Irish. Then he was. I, uh, oh, those those are, um, God, what is it? Uh, local theater actors or whatever. That everything is dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> the, I mean, I mean, famously, we fired him offset, but that you know. Yeah. So, so, yeah. Yeah. The next thing you should have done was walk right in the fucking traffic. Yeah. <laughs> no, I had to give him a, give him a ride right. home. That's right. See, that's how nice. <laughs> that's that's how nice of filmmakers we are. We fired him, and Andy still gave him a ride home. An hour ride home back to where he was, and then have drive yeah, back to set, and then film for the rest of the night. <laughs> Yeah, how fucking funly awkward was that? Oh, Actually, it was, it was great because I, I mean, I, the car I, ride was. Fire I don't, was I don't take pride in it. But after you fire your first couple people, I and you and now you know, ten years, twenty years later, it's not, it's not that bad because it, it's no. always the same thing. If I'm gonna have to fire you, you really fucked up because I'm a really tolerant guy. Exactly, I know your tolerance level. <laughs> yeah, I mean, come on, man. <laughs> That's, yeah, if you can piss off or manage to get fired off one of your sets, then good lord. Yeah, we didn't fire anybody off the last one, and you know what? It's been a while since we did fire. I, I think that really comes with the experience of casting, like we were talking yeah. about too. We we know how to pick the right ones, at least enough to do the job. Yeah, because you're just gauging them as an individual as well as much. But like I said, that goes back to like giving somebody an opportunity, and it's like, hey, do you want to give this? decent actor an opportunity that's a complete dickbag right or want to give it to a guy that's maybe a step under him but you can groom him in that short amount of time right i always i always say that to people that half half (laughs) (laughs) yes i've been groomed half people half half (laughs) people look at me like i'm crazy whenever i say you know i don't know robert de niro at all but if he would if he came in and he said i want to do your movie and he was a giant asshole to me and then there was somebody who was so not famous and he was decent and he was nice and he was pretty talented. I'm, if I have the choice, I'm still okay. going with the decent guy. Yeah. And, you know, and this is, this is saying that I, I, I have a career where I can pass on Robert De Niro, by the way, also, yeah. because if it's right now, I, I'm not passing on Robert fucking De Niro, even if he's the, if he, you know, kicks me in yeah. my balls. Yeah, exactly. But it's just a, you know, perfect example. Like, yeah of a perfect actor that you would never in your heart like turn away but i think that's destroyed a lot of careers for people that were like major stars coming up and then they just disappear because of their behavior on set well paul tell me what you love about hollywood (laughs) (laughs) it's so hard to be nice to stuff like that when you've been around it and you know it's not the industry. It's a lot of the problem is the people in the industry, not itself. It's just how it's been maintained for years. Always. And I think the more you, at least the strategy for us that has worked is, you know, you do fall in love with that kind of glamorati bullshit and you know, it's bullshit and cause it's very shiny and it, it's fun to believe that you're a part of it or you could stand oh. next to it. Or there's some kind of tentacles, you know, that are close to grabbing you. But the more you separate yourself from it and just focus on the work and surrounding yourself with people who are like you that want to do the work, that is really what it's all about. And then you, you look at some of my favorite filmmakers of all time. They did exactly what I'm talking about, too. It's, it's the people, if you're, if you're going into this to be famous, if you're going into this to be a celebrity... It, it's mm-hmm. it. I, I'm. It's sad to say. I I thought that was a cliche, but I don't know if this younger generation thinks that's cliche now because of the Kardashians and all this shit and social media and influencers and everything. But you know, I didn't. I didn't believe I was going to be a niche filmmaker until I started getting older, and, and then the art started to suffer more, and then mm-hmm. people started learning less and knowing less. I mean, even Andy, it's a weekly thing on the podcast here. You'd be shocked at the shit. Well, maybe not Andy, but you'd be (laughs) shocked at the shit he doesn't know after 400 episodes of a film podcast when I'll say name a Robert De Niro movie and the first thing out of his his mouth is meet the Fockers. Well, that was an early episode. That was that was way back in the less than 100 episodes. I but yes, (laughs) that was the high three nineties, <laughs> <laughs> the high three nineties. Oh my god! But th- but ju- that's just one example. But it is. I mean, not to take but, the piss out of you, Andy. But well, yes, I, like, I love taking the piss out of you. But in this in this case, 
life is different nowadays. And if you're not focused on knowing these things about the crap, I mean, you're, you're a producer, you produce everything. What the hell do you care about film history to some degree? Yeah, you need, right? you're a mechanical guy. You, all right, we need to get this done on time and on budget. And I'm like, it looks just like breathless. And you're like, what the fuck's that? I'm like, you know, you ever see the, the Godard movie? You're like, I don't, I'm no fuck. Is that English? And I'm like, no, it's French. You're like, even worse. <laughs> 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 yeah, let's keep going. Let's keep going. But, but yeah, that, that's my point. It's it's Andy doesn't have time to watch a ton of movies because he's so busy living his life, working and making movies. I still find time because I have to because it feeds the writing process. It feeds how good a director I am. There's a there's a romance to it, and that's the and that's two examples of people that are in this industry working. Imagine the kids nowadays. Imagine people that they have no interest. No. And, and it just seems like we are a dying breed. But I'm going to go down fighting because I feel like it. It you, I've been, you know how many times I was told in high school that I was an elitist because of my opinion on filmmaking? And I eventually just got to the point where I went, you know what? Yeah, yeah, fine. It's not a bad thing to be an elitist because you know and can back up the shit you're saying that's opinion. Exactly. Gosh, golly, Willikers, this is so much fun. And if you're having as much fun as we are right now, make sure to tune in next week where we post part two of our interview with actor Paul Rossi. See you next week and keep film alive.